Okay, well you asked for it. This will be a video dedicated to my workflow, what I use, and some of my favorite features instead of my drawing application of choice, Clip Studio Paint. I've used Clip Studio for over 10 years, back whenever it was called Manga Studio actually. I have it both on my desktop and my iPad, so of course I happily agreed to do this review. Thanks to Clip Studio Paint for reaching out, and let's get into it. Welcome to Clip Studio Paint Pro version 2.0. At first glance, the program can seem a little bit intimidating, but every single one of these panels can be moved, collapsed, reorganized, and resized to fit your workflow. The way that I personally have my space set up is with the tools and tool settings on my left, and then my layer panel, alignment tools, action bin, asset downloads on my right. The top bar above my canvas has quick buttons for opening the Clip Studio page, making a new file, opening a file, saving a file, undoing, redoing, clearing a layer, the transform tool, some guides, and most importantly, the infamous flip canvas tool. I have multiple files saved with different dimensions, and Clip Studio itself offers a decent selection of presets and project types. But from the start, typically I start with a new canvas at 4000 by 4000 pixels and a 300 dpi. When I start a piece, I usually sketch with a brush that has a pressure opacity setting that I can build on top of. And then when I refine the sketch, I use something a little more dense and true to how my line art will be. Line art brushes and sizes that I use vary depending on my mood, but I tend to like the crispy and bold ones. Clip Studio Paint has a lot of great brushes already preloaded into the program, but there is a whole built-in asset store that has hundreds if not thousands to choose from, both paid and free. I also love using 3D models in my sketch phase. The asset store has models of pretty much anything that you can think of, including huge environmental pieces. For this art, I'm using a boot asset, which comes with both the left and the right foot. You can tilt and bend each however you like, and it really helps visualize the angles. I'm awful at making those myself, so this is one of my favorite 3D assets to have. Speaking of 3D models, the new head model in Clip Studio version 2.0 is a lifesaver when it comes to quickly creating OC heads. You can tweak every aspect of a face down to the ears in the setting window. And there are also pre-made head settings that you can just adjust to your liking to fit your humanoid character. When you get a face shape that you like, you can save it as a preset so that you have consistent facial proportions and future drawings. This is absolutely my favorite of the new features in 2.0. I'm hoping in future updates that they make it so you can attach a head to an existing 3D body model. That would be super helpful. Once my sketch is done, I start to organize my layer bin. I have a custom auto action that makes group layers for my edits. Inside the edit group, I make one regular raster layer for flat colors a vector layer for my line art, and then clipped layers for each shadow and color. If you don't have the auto action window, you can find it by going to window and then auto action. When you see the little check mark right next to the auto action, that means your window should be popped up on your program. Now to make an auto action, you go to the auto actions tab, select the hamburger menu, edit set, create new set, name it whatever you want the set to be of, and then click OK. Your newly created set should pop up in the bin, and from there you just simply click the record button and go through the steps of the action that you want to make. When you're done, you press the stop button and your auto action is complete. The Clip Studio Asset Store also has some actions that you can download. The ones that I use are mainly for final touches and effects, but the layer setup that I made myself is by far my most used auto action. Moving on, when lining your art, I recommend using the vector layer. It is one of the most useful features of Clip Studio Paint. With this layer, you can quickly erase overlapping lines, change the line width, and even change the brush type. To erase overlapping lines, you want to be sure that in your eraser tool settings, you have vector erase and two other lines selected. To change the line width, go to the line correction tool and you can change how narrow and wide you want the lines to be. Then just draw over the lines you want to affect. To change the brush type, just go to Select Object and Line Correction. From there, you'll see a drop down that has all sorts of brush options you can switch to. The final reason that you should be using a vector layer is so that you can scale up your line art without blowing out the pixels like with a regular raster layer. This is extremely helpful if you finish lining and then realize that the art needs to be bigger. It will keep the same sharpness no matter how much you enlarge it. Now when I'm happy enough with the inks, I move on to the flat coloring. Many of you may have already seen that neat erase outside the line brush. Uh, it finds the edge of your reference layer and it keeps you from erasing inside where you want to erase. 
which is really cool, but the method I'm going to show you works a little bit quicker and more reliably for me personally anyway. And to do it, all you're going to need is just the wand tool and the paint bucket tool. To start, I set my line art layer as a reference layer. This is a little icon that looks like a lighthouse, which uses the layer it's selected on as a guide for certain tools. Then I select my wand tool. You'll want to make sure that in the settings bin, refer to reference layer is selected, which in our case is the line art layer. Then back on my line art layer, I select the areas I do not want my base color to be. Once all of that is selected, I go to the expand selected area tool and pop in a number to bring the selected area closer or a tiny bit in the line art layer. For me, this is usually two or three pixels. Doing this makes it so that there isn't that tiny sliver of color outside the line art layer. Next, on that same toolbar, I click the Invert Selected Area tool. This makes the selected area now the opposite of what you originally had selected. And finally, I use the Paint Bucket tool to fill the area with any color of my choosing. Usually I fill it with a skin tone or a warm pinkish color. When continuing the flat colors, I use the Paint Bucket tool. And to do this, make sure your line art layer is still set to Reference Mode. And then, in the Fill Bucket tool settings, make sure it is set to Refer Other Layers, and make sure Refer Multiple, Reference Layer, and Fill Up to Vector Path are all selected. This makes it so that whenever you fill a color, it will color inside of the lines of the reference layer, aka our line art layer. And if you don't have completely closed gaps in the line art, that's okay too. There is a gap setting that lets you adjust how sensitive the fill is. All of this just makes laying down flat colors so much quicker in my opinion. Now I make a new layer above the base color layer and clip it to that. Then I start dropping colors with the paint bucket tool. I know it's a lot of information, but clipping layers are really cool because whatever you draw on that layer will only be seen on whatever it is clipped to below. I personally like using clipping layers because I don't have to be so precise whenever it comes to coloring. And I usually make clipping layers for hair, eyes and mouth, clothes, the accessories, highlights and shadows. Speaking of shadows and highlights, I really wish I had a clear cut answer for you as to how I shade, but honestly, I just wing it. I have this color palette that I use on either hard light or multiply layer modes for my shadows, and then I use some other colors for highlights on color dodge or add glow layer modes. Sometimes I lock the layers and play with other colors airbrushed in. Other times I just do some airbrushing on a lower opacity underneath the main shadow layer. Sometimes I don't shade at all. I just honestly fumble around longer than I should until I'm happy with the results. If you struggle like I do when it comes to shading, this new Clip Studio 2.0 feature called Shade Assist may just help you out. Though I haven't utilized this much myself, I think this feature is neat to play around with and it's a great way for beginners to block out ideas of where the shading goes or reference lighting points. In the dialog, you can select different colors and blend modes for each of the shade layers. There are options for smooth shading or cell shading, as well as presets for night, morning, backlight, and more. And like everything in Clip Studio Paint, you can create and save your own preset. Overall, I think this is a really neat feature, and it's going to be interesting to see how this helps artists in the future. Final edits for my pieces vary, but more often than not, I duplicate my entire edits folder with all of its layers, merge that new folder into a single layer, and then turn off the edits folder. Then I set a new clipped layer to either overlay, soft light, or multiply and start dumping colors or gradients on it until I'm happy with how it looks. If I want the piece to look softer, I'll duplicate the flattened image, blur it, and then set the blur layer to like lighten and lower the opacity to my liking. If I want it to really burn my eyes, I'll set that same blurred layer to overlay or soft light. And yeah, it's just a lot of trial and error, I think. <laughs> This is also the point in my process where I use some of those downloaded auto actions that I mentioned before. The entire process of finalizing a piece takes a while admittedly, because like most things I've mentioned before, I fumble around aimlessly until I just kind of like how something looks. And that's unfortunately the way that my process is. <laughs> now after X amount of hours and multiple save files and probably a lot of frustration and tears, I will save the file for one final time. And if I was working on my iPad, I'll make sure to save the file to the Clip Studio Paint Cloud so that I can access it on my desktop if I need to do any further editing or if I need to print it out. To do this, in the Clip Studio Hub, you can select which files you want to save to the cloud and if you want them to auto-update or not. Moving over to the Cloud tab will show you which files are saved there and which versions they are and when they were saved. 
The cloud save function is one of my top favorite features of Clip Studio Paint. It is super convenient for me to have all of my things in one place instead of using email or USBs or Dropbox to transfer files over. Plus, Clip Studio Paint gives you 10 gigs of storage for free. After all is saved, I'll export my speed art. That's right, a speed art. Did you know that Clip Studio Paint had a speed art feature? The program tracks every step that you make in the file and records it so that you can export it as a full time lapse of your piece. There are a few options as far as quality goes, with 1080p being the highest, and you can also choose between 15 seconds, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, or full speed as far as exporting goes. That pretty much covers my entire workflow in Clip Studio Paint. There are so many great features in the program and so many ways that artists push the boundaries of what the software can do and create. Though it doesn't apply to me, the program also makes it easy to create multiple pages and export for webtoons. It also has an animation feature that one day I would really love to try. Clip Studio Paint is available on PC and Mac as well as mobile and iPad. If you don't want to commit to purchasing, Clip Studio Paint does offer a free trial for three months and after the trial is up, they have subscriptions starting at 99 cents, which that's the mobile version, by the way. The subscriptions include access to the entire program and all of the latest features and updates. The desktop versions have a one-time payment and you can buy 2.0 with all the features I mentioned now for like $49.99. If you already have version 1.0 like I did, you can upgrade to 2.0 for $19.99 for the pro version or $56.99 for the EX version. If you want ongoing updates with the new features as they come out, you can purchase an update pass, which is about $10 for a year for pro users or $29 a year for EX users. This will include all the updates from 2.0 and up. Alternatively, you can wait until 3.0 comes out, purchase that upgrade with all the 2.0 to 2.9 updates in it. If you use mobile or iPad, you get all of the updates for free automatically since you're charged per year or per month for the license. I do wish that there was an option to buy the license for iPad outright, but at $25 a year, I really can't complain at the price. I know that it's a lot of information, but a full list of prices can be found in my description below on Clip Studio Paint's website. I honestly can't recommend this program enough, and as I mentioned before, it's been my go-to drawing program for years, and I really don't see that changing. Thank you again to Clip Studio Paint for reaching out and sponsoring this video, and thank you for watching all the way through. See you next time!